Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Troubadour Talks. Today, I have Eric Robert Morse on, and we are going to talk about one of my favorite plays, uh, Cyrano de Bergerac by Edmund Rostand. And this is, I, I don't want to get into it right away. We're going to like, save this. We're going to talk about the plot, the character of Cyrano, all this cool stuff. So if you haven't read Cyrano, we're going to try and not give too many spoilers until the end. So I'm personally okay with spoilers a little bit because um, it's, it's how you have to talk about a, a story. But uh, if you haven't read it, we'll try to delay the final spoilers of the climax, the, the, the ultimate ending of the story if Robert, if, if Robert, if Eric, Robert, Morse, and I want to talk about that later. Um, but we will talk about a lot of the events of the story, so be prepared for a plot summary and things of that nature. But before we get into that, um, I wanted to talk about Eric himself. Eric, Eric and I have been friends for years when I lived in San Antonio, and I uh, was part of his book club that he had in uh, San Antonio. And so recently, I know you have published a book, so why don't we, you tell us a little bit about that uh, before we ro roll sure. into um, the arts and Cyrano. Sure. So uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, really excited. I love Cyrano. I love uh, pretty much uh, all of that that time period. And uh, um, we'll, we'll definitely have fun getting into that. So I'm Eric Robert Morse. I uh, write and publish books. Uh, my latest is Tearing at the Seams. It's basically a collection of essays on the last four years. I call the subtitle is uh, tri Tribalism and Postmodern America. So hopefully that does a good description of, of what goes on in that book. Um, very excited. I got about 10 books total, um, more or less social sciences, the history, the economics, that kind of good stuff. Um, relevant to this topic, though, I've got a book on the psychology of storytelling, hmm. which um, is, is was pretty fun to, to research and to get into, and uh, I think ap applicable to something like this. So we might be able to get into some of the psychology behind it as well. Yeah, and you can find all of uh, Eric's works at ericrobertmorse.com. That's Eric Robert M O R S E dot com. So if you're listening on the podcast and you can't see that, check that website out. He's got all of his content, all the books available there. And just as a reminder, I have um, something called the Liter Literary Canon Club, and we take groups, we take individuals of six to eight at a time in a group, go through um, sessions of the entire Western literary canon from the Iliad to the uh, to Gatsby and Ayn Rand. Now, you don't have to follow the whole way. We do it in sections. So if you just want to join us for the ancients, where we do Homer, uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Virgil, you could just join us for that and leave after that if you would like to. So go to troubadourmag.com backslash literary canon club. And you can RSVP for when we do open enrollment and you can get involved in that if you want to uh, help us save the literary canon, because it's going away. Okay, so let's talk about one of these classics that is um, not in the literary canon that I have, actually, uh, but I, it is, I do think it's broadly what I'd call in the, like it's one of the great classic works, probably one of the top plays ever written, um, you know, rivaling along, in my opinion, rivaling alongside Shakespeare, um, Corneille, and that ilk and Aeschylus and Sophocles. So um, let's start off our discussion with a our best attempt at a summary. And uh, now I did watch the Jose Farrar 1950 version last night, I admit, but it's been years since I've read the book. So I have two versions of the book. I was kind of glancing through it and trying to remind myself of some things. And it's coming back, but I think kind of just talking about it might help us or help me in remembering what's going on. So, okay, let's, so we have this character, Cyrano de Bergerac. He's, uh, this is in the 17th century, I think mid 1600s. And feel free to correct me on anything. Uh, he is a Gascon guard, uh, but he's also a poet, a playwright, a philosopher, a scientist, 
Uh, he's one of the best duelists in France. He's a larger than life character. And he enters a stage play that's being, this is the beginning of the story, stage play that's happening um, in France. Uh, and he kicks off this character, this fat buffoon named Montfleur, Montfleury. And he says, you got to get off the stage. And, and he kicks him off the stage. He has a duel with the, um, somebody who, who's offended by this whole endeavor. And, he, you know, he, Cyrano keeps making more and more enemies and then he, um, on his way home that night, I'm just trying to get into the essence of what every, all the events, right? On his way home, there's another character, I'm forgetting the name, Leguin, Leguin, Labrat. Um, there's one, there's another, yeah. it's, another, it's a poet who has offended the Vicomte, this powerful figure mm. in Louis XIII's yeah. um, uh, entourage. And so they send 100 men to, um, to kill him. And yeah, uh, what is? Oh, oh, I forgot one important thing. The the duenna, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. What what's the th important thing? Well, you, do you remember? Well, the 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 driver of the whole um, episode and, and the whole play really is the love interest. The right? love interest, yeah. So Roxanne, yeah, yeah. So, so Roxanne, is, go ahead. Yeah, is uh is at the play. Yeah, and um, we we learn of. Cyrano's love for Roxanne at the play. And um, at the end of the play, or after the, the duel, um, I guess Roxanne's lady maid. Yeah, the duenna. Comes and tells, She's duenna, called, yes. Duenna. Comes and tells uh, Cyrano that, that Roxanne wants to meet with her. Yes. This is, this is actually, so they're cousins, they're first cousins, which. But this is 1600s. Uh, I don't know. 1600s, so it might have been okay. That, that was but, definitely okay back uh, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this this kind of enlivens him. And, and yeah, Cyrano is he he never thought that that uh, such a girl as Roxanne would would have interest in him. So um, this this enlivens him, and and that I think sets off his his uh, rampage against those hundred men. Yeah, he wants to fight giants. He has this great yeah. scene where he talks about a hundred men. You know, I have a hundred hearts and a, or I have ten hearts and a hundred arms, and you know, I want more, I want all you know, send me armies, send me giants. You know, I'm not suited just to fight mortals. So he's this very larger than life person, and you know, hearing this news about the uh, duenna about Roxanne, whom he loves really gets him excited and he goes out and again, I don't remember who he protects, but he goes in to fight to protect his friend. And that says something about him as a person as well, right? That he sure. will not just, sure. it's not just the love, but it's because it's his friend. Although that's a secondary issue. Um, it's definitely, he's excited because of his friend and he fights off these people and he does all of this, by the way, while um, composing ballads, he duels while composing a ballads and on, what is it? What is it on the, um, Quatrain, I thrust, right? Is this something like that? On the yeah. quatrain, I thrust home, or something like that. Um, so that's that's Touch. what's Touché. that? What's that? Touche. Yeah, to, um, that that's I think the basically the climax or the end of Act One, and then in the second act, he meets Roxanne. He learns that she isn't in love with him. She's in love with someone named Christian who, or Christian. Um, who just moved or just came there. He's he's a baron and he's beautiful. Now, I think there's something about Cyrano we haven't mentioned that is very important. And you want to tell him what that is? Yeah. So despite the fact that he is the pro probably the consummate Renaissance man, he can do anything and he does anything well. He's also um, fairly, well, he considers himself to be disformed and uh, ugly. Primarily because of this large nose, so that's the main thing. He's uh, he's basically can do anything, and he's very successful. Except he is ugly, and he's got a complex based <laughs> yeah. on that. <laughs> well, and it's interesting so, the nose uh, because different portrayals will do it differently. Like mm -hmm. one thing I have against the 1950 movie by Jose Ferrar is that Jose Ferrar is yeah. a little too beautiful even with the nose. So if you look oh, at French 
posters of creations of this where I think they understand the spirit of what Rostand is going for in terms of his act, you know, because the French are, they, they love beauty and words and wit and wisdom as well as, you know, this is the height of the, the enlightenment is coming to the France and this is all big. Mm-hmm. And in portrayal, in some of the more accurate portrayals of Cyrano, he's got like a big mole on his nose. He has this big, you know, he's portrayed as genuinely the nose is pretty gross. Um, uh-huh. And in some, some, they're just kind of comical noses. So, it's a really interesting theatrical or artistic choice by the director, which way they go. I think, you know, I like Jose Ferrars, but it's almost, it's comical, but it's almost like he's still beautiful. So it's almost like kind of hard to see the conflict of, you know, as clearly that he doesn't see himself, like you said, worthy of being loved by her, by Roxanne. This is, this is a fascinating um, I guess reflection on Hollywood and yeah. and I guess film in, in general, even if it's not outside of Hollywood. Um, I've noticed this in in pretty much every uh, historical fiction related to royalty. If you look at Elizabeth, we just uh, saw Elizabeth recently, um, the one with Kate Blanchett, and mm, I never saw that. So it, it's actually, it's, it's pretty good. Um, but I mean, Kate Blanchett is, is gorgeous, right? Um, yeah. It's, there's a good reason why she's a movie star. Um, but as far as I know, Queen, Queen Elizabeth was not gorgeous. Like she mm-hmm. had uh, some serious deformities, like maybe pop marks or whatever. I think they, they say. Um, and, and so when you have these, this kind of drama, about the relationship in the movie, um, it, it doesn't make as much sense as it does as it would when um, you consider her actually was a, the attractive level that she was in history. Um, the same with, same goes for um, every portrayal of Victoria, Queen Victoria, <laughs> yeah, um, who in, in in history was not a very attractive woman. But every movie we see of her, she's gorgeous. Gorgeous, yeah. And and on all these dramas, um, like seeking after love and and people not um, eagerly um, joining her side, um, it's all highly questionable in in the movie. But it makes more sense if you realize um, in history they were actually not as not as uh, attractive. Yeah, I I mean it's for me it's about the the art and the end that they're trying to accomplish, right? That's so yeah. I, I'm fine with them fixing up, you know, the historical uh, ugliness of someone from the past and making them beautiful if that you know is the purpose or you know it fits into what they're trying to accomplish thematically in the story or plot wise where this person is supposed to woo somebody and the director doesn't want the audience to wonder why they woo somebody. And, and they don't like today, for instance, we don't realize how historically, for instance, um, you, you're the beautiful woman in your life was your mistress. Your wife was just wealthy and had a good dowry. And that's like that, that value. I think we don't really comprehend in America today. Um, but it was very serious. Like if you read literature, I was just reading Daniel Defoe's Mall Flanders, and she's the mistress of two many men throughout her life. And um, that's that's part of what happens is she doesn't have a dowry. So no matter how beautiful, witty, smart, good character she might have, doesn't matter. She doesn't have a dowry. So the men are all hunting for fortunes and they'll sleep with her and be the mistress. So the point is that, you know, it, it depends what the director today is trying to accomplish. If he wants to, sh- yeah. to convey to a modern audience that this is the most marriageable person on the planet, one way to do that is make it Brad Pitt, right? Or make it something like, and that way it's boom. You know, uh, I guess Brad Pitt's old potatoes now. I don't know who the new sex symbol is for males. Um, but, you know, who, yeah. who, you, you know, Kate Blanchett, to make that way you don't even think about it. She's the most attract, you know, like, um, attractive in the sense of, you know, magnetically attracting all the characters because of that. Right. And that way we as, I mean, again, I haven't seen it, so it depends what they're trying to accomplish, but 
My, my view is of art, I don't care if it reflects reality at all. And with Cyrano, it doesn't reflect that much of reality, even though Cyrano de Bergerac was a real human being. He, he was one of yeah, the first yeah. science fiction writers in history. Um, if you, yeah, he's a great historical figure. Yeah. And, and, and the play doesn't really, it's not uh, 100%. It's not even like 50% <laughs> realistic, but, um, but yeah, I think, but I, it's interesting. I mean, this is a fairly interesting, uh, I guess, important point. Um, cause I agree you, you beautify something. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the, the narrative of the story, mm-hmm. but, um, if you beautify it and their ugliness is actually a storyline, well, that, that's then where we agree. I yeah. Think it does. Yeah. I think it does. Jay. No, that's what, that's what I'm saying. If there is a, a problem with the theme that they're trying to get across or whatever characterization where it's like, this person is supposed to be repulsive and right. the other characters are acting as though they're repulsive, but we look at it and it's like, oh, that's a beautiful woman. What are you talking about? Yeah. And, and that, yeah. so that I agree with and that. So that's saying, that's my point about Jose Ferrar and I think he's the best movie performance I've seen. So I'm not against him. The only minor flaw that I'm saying is that I think in that performance, which is a phenomenal f- performance for a movie of this play, yeah. which is meant for the stage, is that there is that element where he's a little bit, it's not, he's not quite repulsive. Even though his nose is very long and weird, he's not repulsive at all. And the nose doesn't have any. Right repulsiveness and and that's just a choice by the the director and how they have to think about what they're trying to accomplish that's my i think they took the same same approach with um the gerard depardieu version i think it was late 90s yeah and then uh, that was a little ugly and then also right was that the one ugly well i don't know i mean he's no he's still good looking and it's and it's basically just an elongated nose okay like there's no warts or anything so I, I think he's a pretty good good looking guy and um, you might run into the same issue there with like it doesn't it's not very believable that he's that, yeah and it's uh, also the perf- attractive too. yeah and it's the performance too like because the whole essence of the character or a big part of it is that he is the perfect Cyrano is the perfect sold man and he's the perfect bodied man. In every way, he's he's physical. He's a man of action. Yeah. He's a dueler. Yeah. You know, he, he he's a war hero. Um, he's got all. You know, he's yeah. an athlete. He could do anything physically, and he could do anything spiritually, right? He says like, I never go out with soiled a soiled soul, right? He never goes outside with a soiled soul, while some men go outside with the soiled garments, yeah. right? That's yeah. that's who he is. But so you have to really believe when you watch this, and you have to buy into that he doesn't believe he's worthy of Roxanne's love because of this repulsive nose or because of this gross and nose. Almost, and that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. And I would say one more point on that is that the, the, the way that it's formed and I would say this, and then also the Jared Depardieu version, and then also the, um, the Steve Martin version, uh, yeah. Roxanne. Uh, I don't know if you, you I've seen that. that. One. Oh yeah. Um, and I think it's the same thing, and it's it's really becomes a comical piece. It's not gross. It's not grotesque. It doesn't make you think ugly. It's just like, oh, um, that's funny almost. Yeah. And I think that might be, like you say, that might be the point of the director or the um, the producer to to make it almost absurd, like not gross but absurd. Yeah. And. Really, I mean, when it comes down to it, I think that's that's kind of like the point of the whole thing that looks are absurd. And what you're trying to get down to is the meaning behind the looks and the, and the person behind the looks. Hmm. Well, OK, so before we get into that real quick, just th- to finish off the synopsis. Yeah. So yep, we yeah. have this summer because that's an interesting point that you're making. I want to come back to that about the essence sure, sure. of it being about looks. Um, cause I'm not, a, I agree it partially, but not fully. I would have slightly different take on it, but, but we'll, let's, let's talk about that. Let's, uh, for in a, in a minute, yeah. the essence of the story, you know, we have the plot now, uh, up to the, the tryst. So now we have Roxanne loves Christian or from afar, 
we learn that Christian, and we know this right at the beginning of the of the play, Christian loves Roxanne, but he is afraid to talk to her because he is bad with words. And she is a lover of wit and words. She's a lover of poetry and words. And so now we have Cyrano, who is um, a, you know, has this master. He's a master word. poet. He's, he's a, yep. you know, um, a great playwright. And he's, a, you know, just a wonderful wordsmith, even composing ballads while he's dueling, right? And, but he, he, he doesn't have the looks. And there's a line when, uh, so that, that's the kind of tryst. Roxanne from afar loves Christian. Christian loves Roxanne. Cyrano loves Roxanne. Both the males, Cyrano and Christian, believe that they're missing one half of what uh, Roxanne wants. And there's a moment mm-hmm. when um, Cyrano says, you know, when, when the two come together to woo her, which is the next step, they're going to come together to woo her. Uh, Cyrano says, you know, together we make the perfect romantic French romantic hero or something like that. Right. You're the body. I'm the spirit. You're, and, um, and then the, the following part of the novel, the play is mm-hmm. C- Cyrano helping Christian woo um, Roxanne with probably one of the most yeah. famous scenes in all of theater alongside Shakespeare's uh, balcony scene, which is Edmund Rostand's balcony scene, where yeah. it's um, Cyrano telling Christian what to say. And then when Christian finally wins uh, Roxanne, he runs up, kisses her. And there's this really tragic line where Cyrano says, you know, it was, she fell in love with, or it was my words and or she, in his lips or something like that. Right. And mm. it's very sad that he, you know, he can't do be, do the kissing. Um, Classic. Yeah. So that he, they get married and then they immediately go off to war. Right. So that's a very, I think an important plot point is they've, and that's act four is they're at war. Um, and yep. during the war, Cyrano has been sending letters back to uh, Roxanne every day, risking life and limb. And then uh, Roxanne comes through the battle lines and she delivers food for them because she has to see her husband, Christian, because she thinks it's Christian who's sending all these letters. And she's just, yeah. she has to see him. Um, and then right as Cyrano is about to reveal that he's the one who, who sent the letters because he discovers that Roxanne can love him for his spirit, not for, you know, she mm-hmm. says to Christian, I would love you even if you're ugly. And Christian's like, what? Right, because he did, and then and then of course, do you remember what happens next with Christian? Uh, oh well, yeah. So well, he goes and and tries to convince Cyrano to to tell her. Yeah, and well, Cyrano goes and talks to her. He's about to reveal her, that um, Christian is actually, or that Cyrano is actually the one who wrote the letters, and then Christian dies right at that moment. Right on and the then, siege. Yeah. yeah, and then the next line is something like. It's all gone. That's what Cyrano says. It's all gone now. And then, um, you know, so that's basically the end of that act. And then the next act is 15 years later where um, Cyrano, you know, he's walking to every Saturday for 15 years. He's been reading the Gazette to Roxanne. She still thinks that Christian is this perfect ideal man, um, you know, that of body and soul, that he's the perfect embodiment, uh, but only in her mind, really. Uh, she doesn't know the truth. And on his way there, he gets hit in the back of the head with a log that some enemy of his, I think the Vicomte yes, from earlier. Yeah. And he, um, you know, talks to her and I'll leave it there for the plot uh, for you guys to figure out what the ending is like um, there. But that's the plot. Summary. No spoilers. Yeah. So, okay. So, so that's the overall view of everything. Now you're, now you, you made the statement that you think it's about, um, looks and appearances now do you want to flesh that out a little bit more what do you mean by that um well i guess i I wouldn't say it's about looks more than it's about um the the notion that love should be more than just the superficial yeah there's there's uh, there's more to love than um just someone's attractiveness yeah, although um, 
there's to some degree where Cyrano doesn't believe that on a deep level. He believes that it makes sense for Roxanne and the, the, the females in the world to be repulsed by him. That's his view. Right. right? right. Like he thinks that, yeah. that's, that that's true. And Roxanne yeah. um, doesn't think that we don't see in, in her characterization that we see that that's true or not. But we do see that she comes to realize that it doesn't matter. Um, she falls in love with Christian because of his soul more than his beauty. Right. And she's kind of ashamed of herself well, that, at some, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Well, I would, I would say she's an interesting take on this because she, she constantly, she, she never really mentions um, looks or, or like says that that's the, her priority in, in love. Um, she always talks about the words and the um, uh, stirring your soul through these letters um, and then, and then on the balcony, balcony scene when, when uh, Cyrano's voice was, was uh, basically wooing her from there. Yeah. Um, it's all, it's always been about the soul for her. And yet she's, she's still, uh, it, it, she doesn't even think for a moment that she would, she would be in love with anyone other than someone as good looking as Christiane. Right. Yeah. And and that's the first thing it's that just assumed. it's just assumed. Yeah, that's the first thing that Cyrano says when she talks to him in the the bake shop in Act Two when they first meet. Is she starts describing this? She says, "I'm in love." You know, Cyrano says, "Why did you want to meet with me?" And she says, "I'm in love." And he's he's um, you know a man from the Gascon, and she starts describing this heroic man, and we, the audience, and Cyrano think that it's him. Until she says one word, oh, and he's beautiful. And then we, you know, our heart yes. drops <laughs> yeah. and his heart drops, right? Because yeah. he realizes yeah. it can't be him. He's not beautiful. And, um, you know, so he accepts, though, that beauty is what a beautiful woman like Roxanne should want. Like, it makes sense for her yeah. to be with a beautiful man. She's a beautiful he's bitter. woman. He's oh, you bitter think he's bitter? It, but- why do you think he's bitter? Yeah. Well, I think I think he's bitter because uh, well, he she's he's he's trying to um, like when they're dialoguing about Christiane, um, she she said something like his hair is so curly and and Cyrano says something like well his mind might be curly too and mm, <laughs> so, yeah and he's like yeah. trying to pr- persuade her not to just be so head over heels over someone just for looks. Yeah, and, he, um, that's definitely true. Because he doesn't know Christian either, though. Right, at that he, point. He, yeah, at that right. point, he's never met him. him. He, uh, Christian is new to the Gascon guards. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and Roxanne has only seen Christian at the theater from afar. He's in his box, she's in her box. So, right, right, right. So they don't know. And you're right, Cyrano is like, well, how do you know? What You love words, you love poetry. What if he doesn't have those th- you know, things that she's... You know, her, her answer is basically, well, you know, someone that looks like that would definitely have that. Like in her worldview, like there is a relationship between beauty of the body and beauty of the soul. Right. Right. So right. That, I think I think that's true. Now, we find out that Christian is a good man, but he's a simpleton. He's just a right. soldier. He's just a regular, generic <laughs> man. Um, nothing yeah. wrong with him. But, you know, like when he's trying to. When he gets frustrated with Cyrano and he's like, you know what? I'll woo yes. her. I'll talk to her. It'll be my <laughs> words. And then he basically says, as a you know summary or like my synopsis of it, um, or, or in my own words, he says basically, like, gee, I really love you a lot, kid. Like that's the equivalent of what he says. And she's like, well, tell me more about love. And he's like, you know, uh, I, I love you very, very much. <laughs> you know, like I really, really love you. Like that's basically what he says. Yeah. And she's like, oh, pfft. You don't love me. You would say the words that you used to say in the letters and the things that you've been doing. And, and he's like, oh, I can't do that. And then that's when Cyrano, in his own voice, goes and, you know, in very eloquently with beautiful words. You know, he has that line about the the kiss is like the, the circle around love. Like, those are the kinds of things he says. Um, you know, he, he's just wonderful. And, and 
that's like, if you haven't read the story, the play, it's worth reading just for Cyrano's wonderful witticisms just by itself, yeah. uh, which we're not doing credit to. We're only talking about it. You can't get it without actually hearing it and, and reading it for yourself. It's, so I would do both, yeah. by the way, if you're listening to this podcast. Well, I'll do. I'll I'll recommend even more is to uh, look at the French next to the English. Mm. Um, I, I'm assuming you you read uh, the French fluently. No, and, uh, <laughs> I barely <laughs> read it. English. It's taking me 35 it's, um, years to read English. All right, <laughs> but it's so it's so great. I mean, it's. Um, it's in verse, right? And yeah. uh, rhymes brilliantly. And and I guess good translations will, will rhyme in English as well. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Um, or I don't even know if the uh, Jose Ferrer version rhymes. No, it definitely doesn't rhyme. They chose they chose this version, version uh, the Brian Hooker translation, which I think is probably... Okay. I've, I've read three translations. I've also read the Gertrude Hall one is decent. But the Brian Hooker's the best. I don't think like my view my view of translation is don't try like be very careful with trying to translate it into English verse because it's so hard. It's, really tough, right? it's yeah, it's so different. I mean, English versus English is more Germanic in its origin and French mm-hmm. is Latin. You know, it's, it's one of the romance right. romance. So there are significant differences. I think for me it's more about capturing the essence of the ideas of you know the concepts and the concretes that he uses um in you know like the imagery that he evokes he evokes lots of imagery um you know and and here, here let me just give an example maybe we could do this so there's one moment at the begin early on when um somebody wants to start a fight with him this is the guy he duels in the play and this is one of the famous scenes uh, even you know Steve Martin did it. Everybody, everybody who does a remake of Cyrano, and there are like dozens of re- fil- film remakes, and Netflix has like three that they've done actually uh, that are loosely based on it. You can Google it and see all the the loosely based stories. Um, they usually That's screw it up, and it's not that great. But, but you know they don't right. seem to understand. They just make some ugly girl for. There's one. There's some ugly girl who wants to get revenge on people for some reason, but she's stronger. I don't know. So, um, okay. <laughs> that uh, sounds like something. Sounds yeah. wonderful, right? Yeah. So, but so, so this guy who's going to, who's coming to Cyrano wants to start a fight with him because he thinks he's arrogant and he knows, he learns that the one way to start a fight easily with him is to make fun of his nose. So he comes up to yeah. start a fight and he says, you know, basically the, the man says, your nose is very large. And then Cyrano says, like, um, you are too simple. Why, you might have said, oh, a great many things, Mundu. Why waste your opportunity? For example, thus, aggressive. I, sir, if that nose were mine, I'd have it amputated. On the spot. Friendly. How do you drink with such a nose? You ought to have a cup made especially. Descriptive. Tis a rock, a crag, a cape, a cape, a, a, or say rather a peninsula. Inquisitive. What is that receptacle? A razor case or a portfolio? And he goes on for like two pages like that. And he just goes on and exactly. on with all these wonderful imagery about making fun of his, like how stupid he basically is the best at insulting himself. And that I think is how Rostand as a great artist solved a very interesting character problem because you can't be this great man. If you have this really serious flaw like this, not in a romantic mm-hmm. literary sense, in my view. Um, and so what he does is he, not only does he have this big flaw, but he's also the best at making fun of his own flaw. Yes. Like yes. Way better than anybody else. It's perfect. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to have the flaw. And um, Rostand is so uh, efficient in his ability to not only like describe how terrible this is, but also show how strong of a character Cyrano is by uh, yeah by insulting himself in verse and in, in verse rhyming. <laughs> in rhyming and he does it to show up a man who wants to duel him and then he duels him and then he beats him yeah. so again he's yeah. 
um, the mind body thing, I think is the critical for me, that's the critical issue in this story is that conflict between the mind yeah. and the body. Yeah. Um, but it's, and it's excellent. It's, it's like everything that uh, a hero of tragedy should be. Well, a hero in general. I mean, he's, um, why does he, he he's kind of like, uh, um, well, I guess he's, he's argumentative and uh, boastful at, at first. You, you see that, um, like shouting down the, the actor from the stage. But mm-hmm. why did he do that, right? He yeah. did it because the guy, the actor, looked at someone lustfully and well he looks um, at roxanne actually looks at like roxanne yeah. <laughs> and so that they that um, offends them so completely yeah yeah, yeah go ahead. It, it still it shows his his valor and his um how much of a stand-up person he is to um like that's his motivation he's he's a romantic he's a true romantic he's um true well, he's larger um, than life true hero yeah. yeah. And yeah. He's, he's definitely larger than life, right? Because in that scene, he that what that scene shows is that he doesn't just make idle threats. He's willing to follow it through. So it's one thing, you know, you could think of it like there's the intellectual or spiritual thing. If I insult you and tell you never to go on stage or I'll cut you in half or something, right? And those are just words, meaningless words. But for this man of man, you know, mind and body, he means it. So when he says it, yeah. it doesn't matter that there's a whole theater of patrons all paying to see this play. He, as the, the hero, had said, you know, he gave his word and he keeps it. And, you know, he has that scene yeah. where it's like on the third clap, you will poof into the air, right? So he claps three times. And then on the third clap, the guy disappears, even though he says he wasn't going to disappear uh, because he knows. And at the end, yeah, go ahead. And at the end, the, the audience is cheering Cyrano. For his, his uh, show. Yeah, and I mean, that's it's a really interesting um, meta moment because we're, you know, if you're watching it as a play, you're in the theater of a play, right? And you're watching, yeah. the first scene opens up on a play opening up, right? Oh. And so that's how it, so it's like, you, you know, you... The, it's experience. The, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the, the, the curtains rise and the play begins. And then we hear people in the audience of the play talking like Christian sees that person. He sees Roxanne and he's like, Oh, I love her. She's so beautiful, but I'm too dumb and dull to, to be able to talk to her. We hear the conflict right away for the story. And then Montfleury, you know, comes on stage on the stage. Um, and he starts his performance and then, you know, all of a sudden Cyrano opens up and says, get off my stage. I told you three weeks. And then he kicks him off. And remember, he gives all of his life savings as well. Right. So he pays off that guy um, because he's right. a man of integrity. He's a man. And he also likes a show. This is part of who he is. He likes a big show, right? Yeah. He likes to give. A, yeah. And so he, without a second's thought, he throws all his money. And even though he doesn't have any money for food and he uh, you know, has like a, a grape and a half of a macaroon, <laughs> that's his dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, dinner, my drink, my dessert for the, the great. So, yeah. He lives on honor. He lives it's, on honor. That's all, you know, all he needs. Yeah, the minimum amount for the body and the um, and then major amounts for the soul in that case. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I think that's very interesting. And, yeah, so um, and what are some of your – do you have favorite scenes in the story? Um, yeah, I mean, everything – is pretty much a favorite. Um, I'm trying to think of, of any one that really stands out. Um, the most powerful one toward the end, the, the whole um, scene at the end where um, Christian is, is trying to get Cyrano to, to convince her that it was him. And, um, and I mean, talk about honor. Um, Christiane is dying, thinking she loves him or she loves Cyrano. Not well, not but Cyrano, Cyrano does correct him. So Cyrano, in his yeah. dying, 
Like he says yeah, to exactly. Christiane, yeah, that she chose you. But Christ- right. Cyrano never told her. He never finished his thought. So she goes on thinking that Christian, and Christian dies thinking that she chose him. Right. Which yeah. is honorable. It's the only honorable thing to do. I mean, throughout, yeah. throughout it's, it's, it's um, very uh, powerful sign of, of honor throughout, I would say. Um, favorite scenes. I mean, I think you, you got the classic scenes. Um, the, the balcony scene, like you mentioned, is excellent. The, um, the duel scene in the beginning. Um, I also thought, um, it was, it was pretty powerful. So toward the, um, middle, I guess before the, the end of the third act Mm -hmm. when um one of roxanne's suitors the the um yeah patron of the i think it's the uh, vicomte himself yeah i think he loves roxanne as well and he hates loves her he hates cyrano yeah right um for past reasons (laughs) um but so he's he's really ready to go marry the uh or to go propose and, and to um, issue a marriage um with roxanne before they go to war yep and so they scramble and get roxanne to marry christiane yep and um and, and of course cyrano is um honorable cyrano as he is um helps to orchestrate all this rushes them through and then um goes and uh, distracts the Vicom. Um, so it takes them too long to get there. Um, gives them enough time to uh, get married. And by the time that they get there, the Vicom, uh, obviously furious that she's gone and gotten married without him and um, orders Christian to, to haul it, right? To, to get to camp and, um, they're heading out to war, and um, Vicomte says to Cyrano that the wait, the wedding night uh, is going to have to wait, yeah. and Cyrano says uh, something to the effect of uh, that does not. Um, I'm not too uh, worried about that. <laughs> that. That doesn't upset me too much. Not as much as he thought as Vicomte would have thought, because. Vicomte thought he was just doing this to help his friend and despite Vicomte, but really Cyrano is w- helping. So this, I think is the, the core question. So I think you, you put a really good moment to think about is the, one of the core questions for Cyrano, it's named after him. He's, you know, has, it's all about him. I think all the other characters are pretty conventional actually in general. Cyrano is this, this odd character in this play of, you know, good, but normal conventional people. And yeah. um, the question is, why does he help Christian, right? Why doesn't he just, one, why doesn't he just yeah. tell her early on, you know, that he um, loves her and that he can woo her and try that? You know, what's what's the cause of that? But then that we could just say is the nose, and he believes that he's too ugly, he's not deserving of it. But the second question is, why does he help Christian? Why does he really help him? And now I have my thoughts, but I'm just curious what you have as your thoughts for his motivation there. Yeah. Well, I think that goes back to the original meeting, right? Um, When Christian is is introduced to the the cadets um, and, and Cyrano's there and he's, he's telling his, his compadres, you know, about the, hundred men that he just um, deposed or got rid of the, the night before. Um, oh, he killed and, and, and kill, Well, at least he killed 30, some of them. Yeah. Of yeah, he killed yeah. some of them for sure. Then the rest and ran scared off. the rest of them out. Yeah. yeah. Um, Christian comes in and, and he's, he's a little smug and he starts insulting the guy's nose. <laughs> yeah. And Cyrano, well, he's trying Cyrano to prove to the others out. that he's courageous. Yeah, yeah, and and he is. He's he's yeah. He's a 
courageous guy um, and ready to fight. Um, clear, Cyrano clears everyone out yeah. so they can have a, a, a private battle, I guess. Um, but then he hugs the guy. Like once everyone's gone, he hugs Christian as his brother. Yeah. And the reason is because Roxanne has confessed her love for him. And and I think that alone, Cyrano loves her so much that he um, he wants the best for her. And if she loves someone else, then he's willing to support that. Yeah, it, I mean, it's interesting. I, I guess I would add that it's also um, his love or his view that he can win only through the spiritual and that through the embodiment of Christian, he can also win in the physical realm. It just won't be him, Cyrano. It'll be the combination of the two. Cyrano, Christian will be the body and he will be the spirit. But I think, you know, yeah. success is important in this, not in this play because, you know, we see that, um, you know, one of the fi- the lines in the, the finale and, um, uh, so, by the way, I'm going to get into some spoilers at this point a little bit. So if you haven't read it and you don't want spoilers, sign off now. Uh, but I'm going to get into a few spoilers. Okay, you had your chance. So um, with the finale, or one of the last li- um, moments in the, the, the play, he says something to the effect of, you know, it goes to show, something I don't remember exactly, line, but it goes to show like I was even late, or I missed even my own death. Right. And that's because he was murdered by somebody who dropped a log on his head from a rooftop or a high window. And so success plays a really important concept, conceptual role in the story. There's three realms where he wants to be successful. He wants to die a hero's death right on the battlefield. He wants, Mm -hmm. which is the height of, you know, romantic, um, you know, heroics in this era and, you know, lots of eras that to, to die heroically in the battlefield, like Leonidas and his 300. Um, yeah. it, he wants to be a, a published playwright and he wants to love a beautiful woman, Roxanne. He fails mm-hmm. on all three fronts. And, you know, one of the lot before he says the line about, you know, I'm late even to my own death. He is informed that his play, his words have been stolen by Moliere, who's a real life famous playwright of s- similar era, and mm-hmm. he's happy that there was applause because Moliere got lots of applause, especially for the lines that were Cyrano. But again, you know C- Moliere, you can think of in a, an interesting way that even though he's not in the play, he achieves the success that is due to Cyrano. And Cyrano achieves no success. And Moliere is drawn like, or as described in the two scenes he's mentioned in, mm. like um, Christian, and that he's a conventional. That's why he wins. Um, there's, there's a line earlier, I think, in the bake shop uh, work about you know, Moliere, and, and there's a mention of him being a you know, conventional type playwright, not a, not a grandiose playwright. And, you know, so that's in the world of, of Edmund Rostan. That's what we know of him. Christian is definitely a very typical man. He may be brave and courageous, but he's a simpleton. He's just a plain Conventional. soldier. Yeah. Sure. And he wins uh, the kiss with Roxanne. And he wins the courageous death, right? The courageous yeah, uh, death. Yeah, sure. So Cyrano loses <laughs> everything in that sense. And um, so I think, to me, that's a core part of the conflict and the essence of the play is that yeah. tragedy of this overly great man. The way I see it is, you know, this is this story is written in 1898 when it was published or, or first performed. And it's like, this is the end of the romantic era in a sense. Like, you know, you could think of it as like Cyrano dying. He's this romantic character. He's with all these conventionalities and they all want him to be a patron you know, there's that famous no thank you scene, which is my favorite. Uh-huh. That's my favorite scene okay. um, where he says, you know, what should you have me do? Seek for the patronage of some th- great man and like a creeping vine on a tall tree crawl upward where I cannot stand alone. 
And he keep, he goes on and on and says, no, thank you. I want to be, he says, no, thank mm. you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And he says, I want to be my own patron. I won't let my words be sold to the Vicomte, who says he will buy his words, if he gets to change some of them. And Cyrano wants to see his words unchanged on the scene. On that's that, that's yeah. what he lives for. That's that's all he wants. It's just these are my words. I want them completely mine on stage, read out by some great actor. And that doesn't yeah. happen for him, right? Um, so yeah. Well, and um, yeah, I think you you put it uh, very well. I mean, so why why does he help Christian? It's yeah. because he's really helping himself, right? He he knows he thinks to himself that the only way to to get to the um, I don't know even to to take part in these these three successful um, or the three successes that he set out for himself. The only way to do that is by um, basically lying and saying and giving giving Christian his words, right? And I think he he uh, Cyrano um, is really just he's accepting a, 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 set, a sorry condition for himself, uh, a, a sorry fate for himself that he will never be loved. And this is really the only way he thinks he can achieve love. And at the end, um, he talks about how through the letters that, that he sent to, to Roxanne and, and the correspondence in that way, he did, um, he did achieve love finally. He did at least um, glimpse that. Yeah. Roxanne was able to show him that. Yeah, so he felt it in a cursory sense. Well, he learns, so he gets to live with it spiritually, but he doesn't get to consummate it. And I do think there is an important thing where that is stressed in the story where he wants to consummate it. He wants to mm-hmm. sleep with this woman. Like, I don't think that is something he doesn't like. It's not, they don't talk about that. But for instance, when, um, Christian goes to kiss, uh, Roxanne at first, Cyrano is very reluctant, right? He says, no, 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 I don't want to do this. No, never mind. Let's, let's wait till you're going too fast. And Christian's like, what are you talking about? At yeah. some point I'm going to have to kiss her. Right. So why not now? And, and you know, Cyrano says, you're right. And it might as well be my words that win the kiss. And so he's going to win in that sense, yeah, even though he yeah. doesn't get it. And so he, he, right, de- he right. says that to him and he says the words that, you know, this is the, there's a lot, and I don't remember where it is, but that's where it's like, he has this beautiful poetic words, which, you know, any man who can say this sincerely to a woman, you know, will probably get a kiss, right? Like it's just that good oh. of lines <laughs> uh, of like, this is what a good kiss is. This is what I want to kiss you. And, um, you know, so then, but then it's Christian who goes up and kisses. Now, later in that same act, the man who comes for the Vicomte to tell her, or or no, um, when they get married, uh, Cyrano is relieved, as I think you pointed out, that they don't get to consummate their wedding event, right? So I think the consummation, just like you could think of like the applause of Moliere um, and the adoration for the courageous soldier who dies on the battlefield that's kind of the physical body embodiment of the spiritual value right and so i right. i want to live a life of honor and courage the only way to have a f- totality of that spiritual life in action is to consummate that with in that case would be death and the case of the playwright would sure. be the applause of the audience that's kind of like the sex from the audience, right? Is that physical? (laughs) And then in the third realm, it is physical sex with um, Roxanne, which he accomplishes again, none of those. And that's part of the tragedy. That is the tragedy. That is the tragedy for sure. He doesn't get the physical embodiment of it. He only gets to live in the spiritual, which he likes, but I think there is a sense where he wants the physical. He just isn't able to get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, okay, so he isn't able to get it, but isn't that largely due to his own doing? Because he, um, every great tragedy, every every tragic hero has a hamartia, right? 
and the this one in particular it's he thinks it's his nose he thinks his great downfall is his nose but really it's his pride that um sees the nose as um basically this wall against anyone um any success in life he's he's kind of propped this up against himself and made it made it his great downfall yeah um so this i think leads into maybe some final thoughts we can have that i'm very interested in hearing okay. for yeah. you because um i was a little surprised that you chose this story i mean it makes sense when i thought about it but um because the way I interpret Cyrano is that he's the most prideful character in all of literature. Um, he's the most selfish <laughs> character in all of literature. I mean, this is a guy who sings a ballad while he, you know, while he fights. Like that's the embodiment of being proud of your own achievements and abilities. Um, he he says at some points that yeah. I want to be the best in everything right that's a pride in himself he's he you know people think of him as arrogant and you know yeah, so that, that's absolutely. an interesting part of it and he i think he does do all these things for himself you know he has the no thank you seed is i think one of the most eloquent examples of selfishness of i want i want it for me to hell with you. I don't want one iota of your influence. I don't care if the whole world wants it. I want it for me. It's all for me, 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 me. <laughs> That's him. Cyrano's the me guy. And so he's, to me, the most selfish character I've ever read, uh, besides an Ayn Rand <laughs> novel. Outside of like Howard Rourke and, and uh, John Galton and Hank Reardon and all those Ayn Rand characters, which I love, this guy's it. This guy's the most selfish and so I was like, you chose, that's interesting. But you, I think, have a different interpretation of him, right? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I, I think I, I see the way you see it. And I think it makes sense that, that you would characterize him as uh, selfish or prideful or uh, arrogant. And he definitely comes off that way. But we, we see behind what, what's going on behind the scenes. And um, one... I think he wants things a certain way, not because it's him, but because he is good at what he does, and doing it his way is doing it the right way. So, well, but that's what pride I is, think, isn't it? What? Well, no, no. I guess I get. I, I think it could be manifest that way, but okay. I think pridefulness shows up even when what you're doing isn't the right way. Like say say you want something to be done your way, and you don't know you don't know or you don't think that it's the right way, but it's your way, and you and you still force it. I think that's prideful. That's selfishness. It's objectively good if if he does it the right way, and um, and. Well, give, yes. me, give me an example of what you mean by that. Because you're, you're using pride in two different senses. To me, pride is is simply I've yeah. I've done it. Like, yes, I did it. Right? Like, that's the feeling of pride. I wanted to, you know, here's one for me. I wanted to uh, squat 475 pounds, and I did it. And I was like, look at that. I squatted almost 500 pounds, right? Like, that's me. I did it. Or like you wrote, you, you did for you. You run a marathon. Like, look at my time. Yeah. That's my time. I did it. That's to me what pride is. So what do you mean by pride? Mm. Is it's being proud of your accomplishments. Like, I don't, how else do you understand pride, I guess? Well, uh, there, I mean, you could, you could really dig into that. I mean, you can go into the, <laughs> the biblical sense of pride, which is. Well, that's where I thought you, you would know, go. Yeah. Because yeah, of our experiences uh, in our discussions and, of the past. Yeah, right. Um, and it, it's relevant to Cyrano. I mean, there's a whole... I think it's very um, relevant, yeah. ...subplot there is some about um, the the nuns converting him, yeah. um, like basically saving his soul. Um, but I don't think it's... Well, he doesn't okay, love so, them. So the, 
Right. He's yeah. Right. Remember, he doesn't let them. And he says, "Tonight I'll let you pray for me." And then the nun says, "Well, I never wait." You know, when he walks away, she's like, "Well, I never waited for you because she loves him." But he he says, you know, I he, he always refused her throughout until this day. Now yeah. he's gonna die, and maybe that's the reason. But at that yeah, moment. and I, well, I think I think also it's a show, and she knows it's a show, and mm. he knows it's a show, and. Um, I mean, really, the guy, the guy's a saint. He, yeah, that's what he, I thought you were going to say. Embodies, yeah, he embodies it. Um, and this whole act, this boastful act, this arrogance, is a show. And uh, he needs to put forth that show, or he thinks he needs to put forth that show in order to survive in in the cold, harsh world. And it's, I mean, he's got enemies, right? He's he's. What do you mean he has to put on that show? Because that show is the opposite of helping him survive in the cold, hard world. It makes him fail at everything. The show, right? As you correct, right. but he thinks which he I needs call to you what you call the show. Protect himself. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Say that again. He needs to. He needs to protect himself. Um, from what? From the criticism of the cold, harsh world. Yeah, so but he's he's almost preempting the criticism. Of his, Wouldn't of his it be nose, better if he was more like Moliere and he just was more conventional or he was more like Christian and he was more conventional? Yeah. Yeah. But Wouldn't that be easier for him? Up, he would have. To, oh yeah. Yeah, it would. But I think he, he sees it as he would have to give up excellence. He couldn't be. Um, <laughs> it's almost like he's, he's saying to himself, um, the more humble I am, um, the less, correct I am or something along those lines. Mm. Um, so, I yeah, I mean, I, so one thing I'll agree with you on is I think one of the, the influences on Rostan, and you could see this in his other work, by the way, um, particularly with Chanticleer and um, the one he did about Napoleon, where they all fail. And there is that sense of failure in his work. Where Chanticleer is, it's okay. a barnyard animal st- story. I think it's a fantastic play. Not as good as Cyrano in certain ways, but it's wonderful. It's uh-huh. just so romantic and it's out there and it's cool. And it's a beautiful, pro- or beautiful, beautiful verse and poetry. But he, um, it's about a rooster who believes that his crow literally rises the sun. And now and there's all these forces trying to stop him from doing that because they think he's too arrogant. Um, and then, uh-huh. but he does realize that he doesn't at the end. That's he. He learns that about himself. So he fails in a sense in his quest to raise the sun. Um, and so Cyrano fails in his quest. And the the uh-huh. little um, Leo Glon, I think, in in the the Napoleon version, he, which is another play, he fails as well to live up to the eagle, his his uh, uncle Napoleon or something like that. So in all the stories, he fails. And I do think there's an influence of Christianity. But I don't think that's the spirit of Edmund Rostan. I think that's just the influence on him. That there are these saints that all abnegate the body and, in a sense, give themselves up to, you know, world, worldly bodily enjoyment. You know, I think of St. Francis of Assisi, who, you know, you, you, you drink yeah. laundry water, right? You, you don't eat. Yeah. You, you live out in the middle of nowhere trying to get closer. To, and that, I do think there is that sense of that is in Cyrano a little bit, but I think that Rostand is such an individualist. He's such a, 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 you know, a lover of grand men like Cyrano, who mm-hmm. is this type of prideful, boastful. I'm, I'm so good. He's like Muhammad Ali. You know, I'm going to take you out in three, baby. And he goes in there and he takes the guy out and knocks him out in three rounds. Right. And, and he does it while yeah. he's, you know, composing verse. And he's like, I'm the greatest in the world. And that's Cyrano. Cyrano, I'm the greatest in the world. And, you know, um, you know you're know, you saying that it, you think that that is a show. I think that that, that Cyrano really is um, that prideful. Like he really believes in himself. <laughs> and he believes he can accomplish anything. Um, but, of course, he learns that he can't, in a sense. So wh- how would you define pride then in that? Well, I already described how I would define pride is, for me, the virtue of pride is a virtue, not a vice. 
Um, right. And okay. Okay. So I, it, it's good. It's a good thing to write a novel or write tearing at the seams and be proud of it and say, look, I did this. Right. You okay, know, yeah, I wrote a novel. Yeah. It's like, I did this. And I think more right. than that, pride is the attempt to, to the best of your ability to seek perfection on earth of your character, to try to be the perfect person. And by perfect, I don't mean, you know, never having any flaws or accidents, but I just mean the attempt, the continual attempt to be better. And Cyrano has lines to that effect where he says things like, I want to be better tomorrow than I am. To, you know, I, I always want to be better. You know, it's not good enough what I am now. I want to be, you know, he has lines like that. And that to me, that's the essence of pride is wanting. It's a true desire to, okay. and he, I think he truly desires to win in all of these realms. I think he truly desires to win. Yeah, absolutely. He, he desires to win, even though he's resigned himself to not winning. Well, even though I think on a really deep level, he believes that he's not, uh, you know, you could, I can think of it as like metaphysically worthy of Roxanne's right. love. Only in that yeah. realm, I think, and in particular. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because that's the essence because of the plot. The because, yeah, he thinks that beauty attracts beauty in that sense and that he's ugly. Yeah. Yeah. I do Which, think that. I totally agree. I totally agree there. Um, and and you're using your definition of pride. I would agree as well. It's he is prideful, and that's a good thing. I, th I think he's he um, in a in a sense that he believes in himself, but also in a sense that he um, believes that he can accomplish the good. Yeah. Whether it's in his poetry or his um, martial arts, whatever. <laughs> well, his bravery. He can, his like bravery bravery yeah, yeah. is a good thing, you know, and this is the kind of guy who walks across a battlefield, you know, while they're being shot at a hundred times to deliver a hundred letters to a woman who's not even his wife. Right. And to him, that's the height of bravery. And it's, I mean, it would take a lot of bravery to do something like that. Um, to, yeah, to walk, to walk across the battle lines as people are shooting at each right. other. So, yeah. Now, do you think, so, so you, I think I heard you also uh, couple um, pride with arrogance and boastfulness. Um, well, was I would that, contrast that I them. Exactly well, I think okay. arrogance is a good concept of somebody who's proud of something that they haven't earned. So okay. you should be proud of what negative. you earn. What's that? Whereas pride, you see as pride is positive. Uh, arrogance is a negative thing. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think of arrogance as primarily a social idea of maybe of, you know, too boastful. Uh, you know, I don't think you have to necessarily throw your successes in people's faces or your accomplishment. I, I think you should be proud of them. Um, you know, like I think of it as the baseball player who he, he hits the grand slam, wins the game, he gets off. The first thing he says is, "Thank God." Right. Like to me, that's the opposite. It's like, no, thank yourself. You did it like God didn't do, you know, but they all give up their, their, that to me, that's the opposite of pride. Like in that moment, you earned it. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to like get a Gatling gun and shoot it into the air and say, oh, I'm the greatest in the world and run around and slap people's faces and say, you suck. I'm the best. Like that's arrogance. You know, is that like, that's an okay. exaggeration, yeah, yeah. but pride is like, you know, she's like, so how did you feel? You hit the grand slam. It's like, you know, all the work I put in paid off. That's pride. Right. Right. That's pride. right. Well, I think, I think there's a different distinction to be made between accomplishment based on, uh, uh, objective hard work and, and doing what's right and, and doing what's good. And, um, and just accomplishment, um, at, at the expense of someone else or, um, basically not even accomplishment. It's just someone else did something bad and, and now you look better because of it or putting else, someone else down, um, in order to look better. That, that is, um, yeah, that, I wouldn't more, even call that arrogance. Subjective. I would just call that being an asshole. <laughs> like I'm serious. Like I don't, yeah. I, I think there are a lot of people like that. They're jerks. They're, they're cruel. They're yeah. stupid, but that, so like if you're talking about the the 
boss who takes credit for everything that other people do um, and, and makes himself look better and says, yeah, my employees, you know, you, you do what you can with what you got. And really, they did everything and he did nothing and he makes himself yeah. look better. That isn't pride or arrogance. It's not even what I would call selfishness. I, I think it's, um, you know, a kind of irrational dishonesty that will destroy him in a very, you know, like it's a disconnection from reality in the sense that he is not as good as he thinks. And so that's a problem. Yeah. Like yeah. he may succeed in the short run, but he's now going to, you know, so he's going to take a promotion that he's not ready for and he's going to fall on his face and fail and get fired. Like that's what happens right. to those types of people is they make, they start believing in their own successes. Um, I mean, there's a great example of this with, um, what happened recently with GameStop and the Redditors at GameStop mm. is that yeah. a lot of people lost their shirts because they, you know, a lot of those Redditors who stayed in it and, you know, and when investors were professionals were getting out because the Redditors believed that they were good at investing. And it's like, no dude, you don't know. You, you, you gamed the system for a few minutes. Great. Get out. But they're like, no, now we get how this wall street game works we're great at this. It's like, no, dude, you're just a guy living in your mother's basement. Like you're talking about some of the smartest people on the planet who mastered the mathematics and understand how to evaluate companies on a level you could not even fathom. They are brilliant. And you're a moron who just happened to trick people for a few minutes and confuse them for a minute. And now they're going to get back. And a lot of people lost their shirt. And that's what happens to people who... Sure bring other people down in order to bring themselves up for a moment. And that's not pride. That's stupidity. <laughs> right. Bro, I think um, using your definition of pride, there is a distinction, but um, using, using a more, I guess, Christian sense of pride, there's, there's very little distinction there. So what's the definition in the Christian sense though? Like, the def do you have a it's, definition? It's, yeah, well, it's... Um, I know pride cometh before the fall. Yeah, it's basically elevating yourself above God or seeing yourself as being higher than God or being godly, God godlike. So is there any examples in real life of people doing that besides literary examples? I mean, yeah, I mean, every every day in modern times oh okay people like what but do you have an example for me um i don't know uh i mean sport sports well I mean, sh shoot we could we could get into like <laughs> actual christian examples and and well that's what i'm life. asking for whatever you got i gave you like four so give me one you gotta give me one, brother. <laughs> well, okay, so um, the sports, for some reason, the sports are really, um, that, that that's resonating with me. I'm, I'm thinking of the the guy in, in a football game, and he's he's running 90 yards to the end zone, and he starts celebrating before he gets to the end zone. Okay. Right? And... Um, like that that's the sport analogy that, that I would use. And he, he starts celebrating and then the guy comes comes behind him and, and swipes the football away. So okay. he loses his, his big touchdown. Um basically celebrating before he, he uh Yeah, so does what he needs to do. Well, so would you think so do you think pride of like um like celebrating you know, there's that there's that um, picture of Elon Musk where he's going like this and he's just lost his mind. His arms are up and his face is like, oh, my God, when, you know, I think it's the Falcon Heavy or one of his rockets landed, you know, went off into space and oh, landed, yeah, yeah. you know, so he was able it was reusable or something like that. It was a major milestone yeah. and just complete pride and joy in what he accomplished. Do you think that's bad? You think that's pride? No, not at all. Okay. Now I don't. I don't. Um, okay. So, was, we so might celebrating have to, accomplishment is not 
yeah, yeah, we there might, there might we might have to go because so like we might have to put that aside because yeah, I I think we'd have to have a conversation about Christian pride because I think that that yeah. is condemned by Christianity, like that kind of being proud of your accomplishments is not a good thing. Like that is because like that comes before the fall. Like next he's gonna fail. Um, that's because he's too proud. Like that's how I see. Um, and I've understood Christian pride. So yeah, well, I think you might be right when it comes to like Puritans. They mm. definitely yeah. Would so that's have, interesting. Uh, question that yeah, but I don't I don't not think, all not all Christian religions or Christian sects yeah yeah okay yeah and especially I would say Catholic Catholics don't uh, discourage celebrating or or taking joy in accomplishments in life. Well, what about St. Francis of Assisi? Like his whole thing and the ascetic. He was, he was very joyful. Spiritually, very but joyful. not physically. You're not supposed to enjoy the things of the body. Like you're supposed to drink um, laundry water. That's what the ascetics were all about. And that's. Yeah. So, well, there, there might be a different a distinction to be made there, too, because he, he was um, he celebrated uh, nature and and the goodness, the bounties of the earth. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know of anything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably not the best Francis of Assisi. Um, yeah, I don't know all the saints. I know there was, you know, I know 40. him, uh, mostly from paintings about him. I studied it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, but I think from what I, the little I do know, there's quite a few saints that the purpose was the absconding of, the body and the bodily pleasures and those types of things. And, and that includes yeah. the pride you get from your bodily things. And the only, if you're going to have any pride, it should be in how humble you are. Like being humble is the virtue. Pride is the vice. I mean, it's in yeah. Dante's Inferno as you know, the, the, the man who's prideful is the, you know, the worst in the, one of the lower rings of rungs of hell. Right. Uh, any yeah, and, and think, pride in anything you know, pride in his riches, you know, pride in, sure. in his in his castles. You can't have pride in those things. From what I understand. Right. I, I think the the Francis of Assisi reference is um maybe that's a little bit of a um I don't know, a departure from the notion of pride. Like he he was um he, there there are there are sins and there are um vices and, and everything that they, that are about like the world and like, like lust is a, a, a deadly sin. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has to do more with the um, pleasures of the world. Um, like basically being engrossed in the pleasures of the world or the desires of worldly pleasures. Um, and I think pride is different in that, it goes. It goes back to something that you were talking about earlier. It's just basically saying I did that, and and I think you you might be right in that Christians traditionally say, you know, it is sinful to say to look at an accomplishment, and and say, look, this is me. This is me. Um, yeah. So they do they do frown on that, even if you're like you say, they spend. 20 years working hard, working out, mastering a skill or whatever. Yeah. Um, when they did obviously have some sort of role, some great role in accomplishment. So, yeah, I mean, there is, there is uh, an element of pride there in the in Christian sense. Yeah. And I think to bring it back and to, you know, maybe conclude with Cyrano, yeah. there's something along the lines of, um, you know, I, so I, I do think there is a little bit of the Christian influence in the mind body, um, you know, the, the body soul dichotomy that he feels and that there is that inevitable loss. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, the, the pride thing, I'm may, you know, maybe there is a way to interpret it. And I do think it's traditionally been interpreted as that he's very selfish or very um, unselfish. Because he and he's very not prideful because he does allow 
even though he hesitates, he allows Christian to go kiss her. Right? He does it for Christian, even though he loves Roxanne. So he get, so there are Christians who interpret Cyrano in the opposite way that I than I do, and that they see that as not a selfish or prideful act. He has absconded his love for Roxanne in the name of Christian, Christian, who wants, you know, so it's basically the ultimate act of sacrifice, right? It's like, yeah, I, yeah, we exactly. both want this girl, but I'm going to, I'm going to back off and let you have her. That's how a lot of people interpret Cyrano. I don't agree with that at all yeah. as an interpretation, but that's how a lot of people have interpreted it. Yeah. Well, and then, and then he suffered the last 20 years of his life, uh, living in chastity, um, and loving her uh, platonically, um, knowing that she actually did truly love him and could love him anyway. Yeah. The The problem is I think the climax is when Christian dies. And the challenge is if you think about what exactly, I mean, this isn't modern time, so it's proof is hard. So if you try to take the context seriously, what could he say in a certain regard, you know, when Christian dies? He was about to reveal, Cyrano was about to reveal that he was the writer of the letters, but now the person who can corroborate that is dead. So all it would amount to is, oh, by the way, I love you, and he's actually a fool. And it's like, why are you pissing on his legacy? Like, like he just died, a courageous <laughs> act, right? And it's like, Cyrano can't really do anything now, I think that's the true. 15 years, that's where the, like the act five, I think that's maybe where the Christianity comes into play um, and at the end there, especially because in that moment in act four, when he di- when Christian dies, there's nothing he could say. Like there's, like there's nothing he could say true. and still be good person, you know, respecting Christian's legacy because he is a courageous man. He's a brave, courageous soldier. And, um, and again, he also can't, how is he supposed to convince her that it's true? Yeah. Well, and I think he could convince her, but even if he did, I think you're right that she'd be like, well, you're just trying to, uh, you're just taking advantage of this poor soul died, who died, uh, just now. Like, um, she, she would, she wouldn't, um, realize her love the way that she did at the end of act five, right? 15 years later. Well, there, there would have need to be some sort of space in there. Well, yeah, I agree. There would have to be some space. So like he couldn't tell her. My point is that he could not tell her the moment Christian dies, which is, in, you know, during that war. But when they got right. back, you know, six months, a year later, he might've started revealing some of the truth. So the question is, right. why does he wait 15 years and he only tells her on her, di- and he doesn't even tell her. He just allows it to be revealed, and then I guess he does kind of tell her by reading the Gazette. No, no, he never tells her. He, he reads the Gazette. He he tells her he's gonna die by saying, yeah. "Oh, yeah. I haven't finished the Gazette on Saturday." Cyrano dies from foul murder, and she's like, "No," and he reads the letter from him from Christian, she, she thinks it's from Christian to her. And it starts with, you know, I, um, you know, I write this on my last day because they're, by the way, during act four, they become surrounded and they're going to die. They think everyone's going to die. Um, and so, you know, the letter says, I'm going to die. This is, you know, I love you. You're in all these eloquent, eloquent words. And then he reads it again. (laughs) Cyrano reads it because he memorized it because he wrote it. He reads it to her yeah. again, and then there's that wonderful line, which may be one of the best lines in the whole story um, from Roxanne, where she says, yeah. you know, I've only loved one man, and I lost him twice. And he's died twice for me, or something like that. Which is <laughs> one hell of a line, right? And that's awesome. Yeah, so th- I think that's, you know, so the, but the question is, why did he wait 14 years, let's say? You could have waited one, and that's where I think some of the Christian sacrifice thing does come into play mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, yeah, I you know it's 
he can have he could have like let it slip or something along that time but he waited 15 years um to yeah. even let her you know find out a little bit so. yeah it's it's either christian um just honor and charity um goodwill or it's um just prideful foolishness yeah, I mean that. I guess that's. I think Cyrano it might be both. Perhaps, yeah. I think that's a. It's an interesting interpretation. That's where you and I diverge a little bit and uh, how we yeah. look at it. But that's that's interesting in terms of interpreting literature, how you know different perspectives. Yeah. So. But um, any last well, thoughts on Cyrano and why you love it, and you know why you chose this one? Before we go. Yeah, well, I just I think um, we need more Cyrano. Uh, I think it's kind of like the last great tragedy that that we see in the Western tradition, um, just before the 1900s come around and um, basically uh, dismantle all traditions. Um, yeah. And I think I mean he's he's the great hero, Cyrano. Uh, it's you got a story full of archetypes and um, it's just a great heroic tragedy and uh, we need more of it these days. So that's definitely why I wanted to talk about it and who knows, uh, we could promote it and, and uh, generate some more <laughs> for this next century. And maybe have some more people put it on as a play so I can actually see it. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard it's... Nice. Yeah, I've never seen it as a play. I've only seen it as movies or read it. So it'd be great to to actually watch that. And I agree. I mean, you know, I agree with you in terms of um, we in the West need these great heroes. We don't have heroes like this that yeah, are larger you know. than life, like specifically larger than life on purpose, right? They, yeah. And it's true that they're not the, the realist, you know, it's not realistic. Cyrano, that's the point. Like, it's not supposed to be realistic. Why would you want uh, realistic? You get realistic in your everyday life. You go to the theater to see grandeur, to see elevation, to uh, see be inspired, what, to be inspired, to to you know have stars in your cape that will be asterisks on your um, on on the the words that you write to your lover. That's something Cyrano says. You know, that's that's the kind of grandeur Beautiful. and the wonder of the greatness of man and mankind that we need a vision of that. And we, I agree. We don't have that anymore at all. Um, it's very symbolic. I think to the end of the great, even romantic era. Cause I think this is the height of romanticism with Edmund Rustin. Oh, it's, wow. it's a big part of romanticism. Well, just like the grander, bigger than life characters were big in romanticism. Yeah. And um, it's very telling that Edmund Rostand died in the uh, flu pandemic of 1918, actually. And I think that oh, interesting. ends, you know, during World War I with the rise of modernism that and the death yeah. of Rostand. You could think of him as like the last of the great romantics, the last of the greatness of 19th century, and which is the culmination of thousands of years of thinking and then we have modernism, which basically is a scythe that cuts that in half and puts away with all of it. And, you know, I'll conclude by saying we're bringing it back with the literary canon club by trying to inspire people to read yeah. great literature. So here's to that. <laughs> and, and to go out and read Eric Robert uh, That's M O R S E.com. Check out his work as well. So Eric, thanks. Been a great conversation. And I hope to have you on the show again. Sounds good. Cool, man. Thank you.